Hey, good evening, everybody. If you would, open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 19. After tonight, we'll have five more chapters of this book, and then we'll have completed 1 and 2 Kings. Booyah! If you need a Bible, by the way, or a pen or something to write on, just hold up your hand for a second. We'd be glad to provide one for you. 2 Kings chapter 19. We have a winner right in the front row here, Anthony. A man, Trevor. All right. So um, if I didn't see you on Sunday, just a quick mention that um, myself and our team are back safe and sound and healthy from Kenya. If you were kind enough to pray for us, thank you. Um, it was an awesome trip. Um, I could tell you more about it later. I could use the whole time up to tell you, which I won't, but just suffice it to say that God did a lot of really neat stuff, really good ministry to the people over there. To me, this is my second year in a row of going, and this year it was really special to connect more with the people, the pastor. They got some wonderful young men that are being trained up to go be church planters, um, and that's exciting to get a chance to invest in them a little bit, invest in the church there, Calvary Githari, and... Um, it was just a really neat ministry. I tell you, if you get a chance to go on a missions trip, I really encourage you to go on one. They will change your life and they will expand your view of the Lord and what He's doing and who He is. I mean, these are people on the other side of the world in a totally different culture still singing to and worshiping the same Jesus that we do. That's pretty cool. Now, some people were wondering if, you know, we were afraid to go. There was a little bit of a... Um, controversy about that. And, and, you know, if I would have been afraid at all, we wouldn't have gone. But we weren't afraid at all. But there are things in life, there are times in life, there are situations in life which we face can be pretty scary, right? Have you ever had a situation or think about a situation that you've had to face and, and maybe you're in one right now where you feel scared, you feel overwhelmed, you feel helpless, you don't know what to do. Have you ever been in a situation like that? You know, maybe it's a, a health problem or a marital crisis or some kind of financial situation or job conflict. There's a lot of possibilities in this life. You know, for me, I have a couple of times, but one of them was when I was unemployed for a period of time. And I'm married, and I got a couple of kids and bills and all this, and there was a point where I didn't really know what my next job was going to be, if I was going to continue to do what I'd been doing. And I confess, I didn't, I didn't react in all the best ways possible. There are things that I should have done that I didn't do. There were things that I did that I probably shouldn't have done. How about you? When you were in that crisis, feeling those things, how did you respond? How did you cope? Or maybe right now, if you're in something, there's something going on intense in your life right now, how are you trying to deal with it? I mean, life is hard, man. Sometimes you get this stuff that happens, right? Even as a follower of Jesus. Well, tonight we're going to continue to look at a character named Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. And he faced... An extremely overwhelming, frightening situation. And I believe that we can learn how to cope with our own crises that we face in life as we examine how Hezekiah reacted to his. And also at the same time, we're always going to be reminded just of how good and how faithful our Lord is. We can always use that reminder. And so... If you're taking notes tonight, our subject is the Lord delivers Jerusalem from Assyria. And our objective is that we would learn to trust in the Lord during our trials. And before we jump into the text, I always like to just invite all of us to pray together and let's ask the Lord to speak to us tonight so we can hear Him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the time of, of music worship we just did and just so many wonderful truths about who you are that we celebrate and remember. And Lord, we just come tonight now, it's the middle of a busy week, it's dark, 
and we're tired, but we come because we, we love you, we want to know you more, we need more of you in our lives, and we want to hear from you tonight. So would you please speak to us, Lord, through your spirit, through your word. Help us to hear you clearly. and Help us to um, just respond in faith to what you tell us tonight. We just come with open minds and open hearts and anticipate what you're going to say and do. To your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a quick context, too, before... I've been gone for a couple of weeks, so we've got to catch... I've got to catch up with this. Um, last week, uh, we saw this, this nation, Assyria, kind of northeast of, of Israel and Judah, and there was a king named Shalmaneser. And basically, what we saw last week was he came down and basically attacked... And, and overcame and destroyed the upper, the northern nation of Israel and took them away captive. So they're gone now. Remember, Israel as a people split into two tribes, right? Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Israel in the north is now gone. They rebelled against the Lord. They sinned. God warned them over and over and over and over. And finally, he let the Assyrians come in and destroy them, take them away captive. And now, some time has passed, and there's a new king in Assyria named Sennacherib. Spell that one. You'll see it up on the screen. Sennacherib is now the king of Syria, and he comes down now, and he's going to start attacking the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. And as we saw last week, he's been very successful, and he's basically captured all the main cities in this kingdom, except for Jerusalem, the last bastion of hope. And in an effort to avoid being totally conquered, King Hezekiah sent a huge sum of money to Sennacherib to try and appease him so he wouldn't come and destroy them. And that worked for a little while, but that wasn't enough. At the end of chapter 18 last week, we see Sennacherib sent a delegation, some representatives from him, down to Judah to meet some of King Hezekiah's guys. And basically, then Hezekiah's guys took the message that they received and they brought it to King Hezekiah. And that's where we are tonight. And so let's just look at the first seven verses of chapter 19 and see what happens. This is 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rab Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. In verse 5, So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Let's just stop right there. The first section we're looking at here, we see that the Lord promises deliverance through Isaiah. And we got to just talk for a second about Hezekiah, just in case we've forgotten. Hezekiah was a good king, very rare as we read through these books. But he was a good king. He believed in the one true God. He was faithful. He trusted the Lord. In fact, last chapter tells us he was probably the best king that Judah ever had. So he's a good guy. And it says in verse 1, when he heard it, and the message that he heard, his guys had met with the king of Assyria's guys, and they came back with this message. And I'm going to summarize what the message was. Here was what he heard. You have absolutely no chance against us. Don't be a fool and say you're going to trust in your God. No one has been able to resist us. Don't let this foolish king Hezekiah convince you people to trust in your Lord. Don't let him trick you into that. None of the gods of the other nations have been able to help them. We've wiped all of them out. 
So if you want to live, you better surrender. This is what Hezekiah heard in verse 1 of chapter 19. I mean, you can imagine how he felt. Here's this gigantic nation that's going around conquering, brutally conquering all these other peoples and nations, including their sister nation, Israel, just north of them. And now here they are. They've been attacking Judah, wiping out and capturing all these cities, and they finally got to Jerusalem, the heart of the, of the nation, God's city. And they've been besieging them for a couple of years now, and they're wearing down. And Hezekiah is not just worried about himself. He's not just worried about his family. He's the king. He's responsible for all these people. What's he going to do? And he looks and he sees there's no hope. There's no help. A desperate situation. And it's interesting how he describes it, this little parable in verse 3. The children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. Basically, Hezekiah cont- compares this whole situation to a mother who's in labor and is just about to give birth to her child, but she's not strong enough to even give birth to the child, and therefore both of them are going to die. That's the desperation. Jerusalem needed to be delivered from this king, Sennacherib, but Hezekiah was helpless to make it happen. So what's he going to do? How is he going to respond to this situation? You know, he could have just freaked out. He could have panicked. He could have just decided to surrender and hope for mercy. But he didn't. I love what he did. It says here in verse 1, He tore his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he went into the house of the Lord. Basically, his response was beautiful. This idea of tearing his clothes and covering himself with sackcloth, which is like a bag-like garment that's coarse, it, it shows humility, it shows repentance, it shows great mourning. He humbled himself. This is the king. And it says, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he went to go seek God. And he also sent some of his guys to go search out the prophet Isaiah because he knew Isaiah was a man of God. And so he sent them to go get some wise, godly counsel from a man of God. Some good choices, huh? I think so. I wish I would have done those things. I'm hoping the next time I have a crisis, I'll remember to do these things. And I hope that you will. These are things we need to do. He talks about the remnant that is left. Basically, Jerusalem is the only city that hasn't been captured. I mean, they're at the very end of their existence. And so I love God through the prophet Isaiah responds. What does he say in verse 6? Thus you shall say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So easy to say so hard to do? Man, when we face these situations, our first reaction is to get afraid and to freak out a lot of times, isn't it? I wanted to brainstorm this with you for a minute. God says, do not be afraid, and yet often, maybe most of the time, we get afraid. Why why is that? Why do we get afraid when we hit these crises and face these situations? What do you think? Yes, Linda. Linda. We can't see the future. It's unforeseen, and so that's scary. Yes, yes. We don't trust the Lord. That really gets to the bottom of it. We really don't trust Him fully. Why else? Why do we get afraid? Yeah, Richard. Oh, yeah. Our minds get going, and we play out scenarios of what might happen. Yeah, Bill. We like to be in control. Who, you? (laughs) We like to be in control. Lord knows that's me. And when things feel out of control, they get scary, don't they? Why else? Yeah, Ron. Well, we know that God can deliver, but He might not. (laughs) Well, that's true. We know God can do it, but will He? There's no guarantee, right? 
Anybody else? Just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Oh, we're in the back. Anthony. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we psych ourselves out and we feel like maybe we're not good enough or we've been bad enough that he won't rescue us or he's going to let us suffer. And yet, God says, do not be afraid. Let me share a couple of verses with you to encourage us in this. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8 and verse 15, says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What Paul's telling us is we are children of God. We are his kids. We don't have to be afraid anymore. When we hit a hard time, we can cry out to Dad for help. And I love what David wrote in Psalm 46, verses 1 to 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. The reality, and I know we know this, but we're all going to be reminded of it, is we do not have to be afraid when we face circumstances or situations that are overwhelming and confusing and we feel helpless and we don't have the answers and it feels out of control. We do not have to be afraid. Now, I don't want us to go beating ourselves up when we struggle with feelings of fear. That's our fleshly human nature. There's always going to be that battle between the flesh and the spirit, right? But the truth is, we don't have to be afraid. Our Father in heaven says He will take care of us, that He's there for us. And that's what He does here. He says, He makes a promise through Isaiah to Hezekiah and his guys. It says basically, I will send a spirit upon him, Sennacherib, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. He's basically saying, I'm going to somehow influence this guy, and he's going to hear a rumor that he's being attacked somewhere else and have to go do that, and he's going to leave. And eventually, he's going to be killed in his own land by a sword. So God assures them of deliverance. And that leads us to our next section here. Sennacherib threatens again, and this time Hezekiah prays. Let's look at verses 8 to 19. Then the Rabshakeh, he's the representative of Sennacherib, returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, look, he has come out to make war with you. So there's the rumor that he heard. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria had done to all lands by utterly destroying them. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Goes on and Haran and Rezeph. And the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, and the king of the city Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Verse 15. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cher cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. 
What a great prayer. So just as the Lord said, the king of Assyria hears a rumor that he's being attacked somewhere else, and so for a moment anyway, he diverts his attention and his military weapons towards somewhere else, away from Judah and Jerusalem. But they don't forget about him. He sends his guys down again with another message for Hezekiah. And basically, he's saying the same thing. Man, don't be deceived and think that your God is going to be able to help you and rescue you from us. Take a look at how we've wiped out all the other nations. Their gods haven't been able to do anything for them. What does Hezekiah do? He takes the letter that he received and he goes before the Lord and he lays it out before the Lord. And I love the, the imagery of that. Have you ever had something going on in your life and you just go and you just lay it out before God? You just bear your heart and soul. Good, bad, and ugly. Just your honest feelings and thoughts and just lay it out before him. We can do that, you know. For one, he already knows it. But two, nothing, nothing's going to surprise him. Nothing's going to offend him. You know, I'm a parent. I love when my kids come and talk to me and share their hearts and their lives with me. And our Heavenly Father is the same. He wants us to come and just lay it out before him. He can handle it. And that's what Hezekiah does here. There's a beautiful verse from 1 Peter that encourages us to do that. Peter understood this. It's 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. It says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. In, in this, Hezekiah starts this prayer off. I just want to read this again because it's beautiful. Verse 15. He says, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim. You are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. This idea of the cherubim, you remember there's the Ark of the Covenant and the, the, the top of that was called the mercy seat. And at each end of that were these cherubim, these, these angels, these angelic beings that were there. And supposedly uh, that was where the God, the presence and the power of God, the Shekinah gl glory of God resided on earth. That's what that reference there. But what I, Hezekiah is doing here is he's starting his prayer off by remembering, by reminding himself of who God really is. He's our creator. He's the one and only true God of all the earth and the universe and everything in it. And you know, when we have these problems, when we face these situations that are so overwhelming, if we can start off by not focusing on them but remembering who God is, somehow as we really meditate on who God is, that can make our problems start to shrink. And that's what Hezekiah is doing here, and it's a good example for us. If you're struggling with something tonight or whatever you're struggling with, take some time out from just being so obsessed with that and focus your heart and your mind for a little bit on who God is. And that's going to give you some perspective. And Lord knows we need perspective in these times. And then he humbly, Hezekiah just is humble before the Lord again. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and save us. He just humbly asks for help. God, I don't know the answer. I can't figure this out. This is overwhelming. I've got huge responsibilities here. People's lives are on the line. I don't have an answer. Help. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Not a fun place to be in, but yet there's something sweet about it when we're that broken and dependent on God and His mercy. And that's just where He wants us to be, you know? And it's so beautiful what He says. He doesn't, He asks God for help and deliverance, but why? What's the reason there? It's for His glory. 
It's not because we're innocent people and we deserve to be saved. Lord knows they weren't. Lord knows we're not. Because we've done such good things, God, we deserve your rescue. He prays, no, God, do this so that the nations will see that you are the one true God, that you will be glorified. What a noble prayer. Are you able to pray that sometimes? God, let this be done, not for my sake, not for the sake of others, but just for the sake of your glory. So you can look good. So you will be lifted up and other people can know you and see you working. That's the highest form of prayer. That we should all be trying to get to. To pray for the glory of God. the next section we see the Lord answers Hezekiah's prayer. Let's look at verse 20. Then Isaiah, first of all, he has some some words for Sennacherib, and then he's going to have some words for Hezekiah, and then he's going to make a prophecy. So let's look at God's words to Sennacherib first. Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel." By your messengers you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of its borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it? From ancient times that I formed it, now I have brought it to pass, that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops and grain blighted before it is blown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in. And your rage against me, because of your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. Let's just stop right there. Remember this first section now, this is the Lord's response, and these words are directed toward this evil king of Assyria, Sennacherib. And I love how, first of all, it just starts off through Isaiah, and he says, I have heard your prayer. That was true then and that's true today. God hears our prayers. If you're like me, sometimes I question that. It doesn't feel like He hears them sometimes, right? But we've got to believe in faith. The Lord hears our prayers. Sometimes He doesn't answer the way we want Him to. Sometimes He doesn't answer as quickly as we want Him to. That does not change the truth that the Lord hears our prayers, as He did here. And then this whole thing about this virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you and laughed you to scorn. Basically, Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem here, is being depicted as a young virgin who's about to be attacked and ravaged by this evil attacker, Sennacherib and the Assyrians. And yet, she's not afraid. Because she knows. She doesn't have to be. And then the Lord says to Sennacherib, you have blasphemed me. You have, you have disgraced me. You have said evil things against my name. He says, whom have you reproached and blasphemed? The Holy One of Israel, me, the one and true God. How had he blasphemed him? Two different ways. Sennacherib, this whole time, he's been comparing the one true God of Israel to all these other false gods of all these other nations putting them on the same level. That's blasphemy. 
And the other thing that Sennacherib did is he's boasting about all this stuff that he'd done, all these places he'd conquered, all these, these, the whole thing about Lebanon and these cedars, that's all these important people and important places that he dominated, that he'd conquered. And he's boasting about all of it. And what God says is, listen, man, this is a paraphrase, the only reason you were able to do that is because I allowed you to do it. I was using you to accomplish my purposes. It wasn't you, it was me. And the fact that you're trying to take the credit and the glory is blaspheming my name. That's what God is saying to Sennacherib. And then in verse 25, God starts to set the record straight. He says, I am sovereign. I am in control. I formed it. I made it come to pass. Everything that you did was according to my will. I'm in control, not you. And the third thing that the Lord says to Sennacherib is that judgment is coming. I know your dwelling place. I know where you live. <laughs> I know what you're doing. You're going in and you're coming out. I know your rage against me. I know what you're saying about me. I'm completely aware of everything that you've been doing. Therefore, and this phrase is interesting too, I'm going to put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips. And that's a reference to what the Assyrians would do when they captured prisoners. A lot of times they'd put a hook in the, the prisoner's nose or lips and they'd tie them together with ropes and lead them along. And God's saying, just as you do with your captives and your prisoners, I've got you like this. I'm going to have you like this. I'm going to take you where I want you to go. The Lord was saying, he's going to conquer Sennacherib and turn him around and send him back home where he came from. But he's not done. The Lord is not done speaking. In verses 29 to 34, we see some words that are meant for Hezekiah. Look at verse 29. God says to Hezekiah, This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such as, as grows of itself, and in the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year sow and reap plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Let's just stop right there. These are the words of assurance and promise and prophecy that God is saying now to King Hezekiah. The first thing he says is, I'm going to give you a sign. And basically the sign is that for two years the people would not be able to raise crops as they normally would because they're being attacked and besieged by the Assyrians. But they'd have to grow things that had not been already cultivated. But in the third year, the Lord would deliver them, send Sennacherib back where he came from, and once again they would be able to raise their crops and eat as they normally had been. That's what that means. God's assuring them of his timeline of this. And the second thing that the Lord says in here is that I will defend this city, this city Jerusalem, the city of David, for my own sake, he says. And he says, for the sake of my servant David. You know, all through this book, there's been a reference to King David and holding him up as the standard of the good king. And even now, the Lord himself says, I'm going to save this city for my servant David's sake. Man, that's, that's cool that David had such a special place in the Lord's heart, and vice versa. And remember, we know David wasn't perfect, <laughs> far from it. But David loved the Lord, and David was faithful. He never turned to those other gods, and that's why he's held up as the man, as the guy. So God defended Jerusalem not for the sake of the city. Jerusalem deserved judgment. They were still idolatrous. But God did it for his own sake, and for the sake of his faithful King David. And it's the same with us. You know, God blesses us. God promises to rescue us, not because we deserve it, 
I mean, we're all sinners saved by grace. But he does it because he loves us. He does it because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He does it for his own namesake so that he can be lifted up and glorified and Jesus can get the glory and those who don't know him can be drawn to him. That's why God does it. In this last section here, let's look at verses 35 to 37. We see the Lord fulfills his promise of deliverance. (laughs) It's quite a story. Verse 35. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away and returned home and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So we see some fulfillment of Scripture here, don't we? Some prophecy. It came to pass, God sent out an angel, and in one night he killed 185,000 of the Assyrians. Imagine waking up that next morning and seeing that many corpses lying around. Apparently there were some left who saw that. The Lord just miraculously intervened and did something that Hezekiah or anybody else would never have dreamed would be a possibility. And this is something we need to remember when we face situations that look so hopeless and we can't figure them out. God can do more than what we think. God can do anything. doesn't mean he always is going to do some miraculous thing, but sometimes he does. And he can if he wants to. Hopefully your situation doesn't involve killing 185,000 people. And so what happens? Sure enough, Sennacherib hightails it out of there and goes home, just as the Lord said was going to happen. He goes back home. And then in verse 37, it says, Now it came to pass. You know, there's a little bit of information that we don't get right from this text. About 20 years passes. 20 years passes. He's back home. 20 years later, he's worshiping at his idolatrous false god's temple. And his own sons come and strike him down with what? With the sword. Just like, remember, way back in verse 7. He's going to fall by the sword in his own land. Just as God said, but 20 years later. My wife pointed this out to me as we were talking about this tonight, and it's, it's a good reminder that, like we said earlier, God answers our prayers, but sometimes he's on his own timetable. <laughs> you know, 20 years. No. But it's true. But because we know He's God and we know He loves us and we know He knows what's best, 20 years is the right time. And if you're waiting for an answer, the reason God hasn't given you yet is because it's not the right time yet, because He knows what's best. We don't understand all of His ways. But 20 years later, just as God said, it went down. By His own sons, He's murdered worshiping his false God who could not deliver him. And so, bringing it back to us tonight, when you think about your life, your life, are you being attacked or threatened in some way right now? Most of us We don't get our lives threatened like this, but we get attacked in other ways. Trials and tribulations and temptations, suffering. Are you, right now, are you feeling that that, that those feelings of being afraid and and overwhelmed and, 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 and helpless to do something about it? And, And if you're not right now, you will someday. 
That's the thing about life. We're all going to hit these times. And man, if you can be prepared ahead of time, if we can learn some lessons from Hezekiah before we have those things happen, we're going to be in such a better position than trying to figure some of this out in the midst of it. And so what do we do when we have these things where they're so scary and overwhelming and we feel helpless and out of control? We do what Hezekiah did, and I want to summarize it. The first thing he did was he humbled himself. Remember, he tore his clothes and put on the sackcloth. We don't have to do that. But the idea is to humble ourselves before God. And he turned and he went, he came to God and he prayed. Sometimes... We get to the prayer, but it's after we've tried to do 50,000 other things to fix the problem, right? Where it should be the other way around. Let's humble ourselves and go and pray first. First thing, man, go to your knees and just say, God, help me, before we start all the scrambling. And then he also sought counsel. Remember, he sent some guys to talk to Isaiah. we're We're in this battle together. And God uses us in one another's lives. And so when you're in a situation, reach out to some people for some godly biblical wisdom. People who know the Lord themselves. And then in the midst of it, I loved what Isaiah did. Remember, he prayed that prayer and he started off just by reciting who God was. We need to remember who God is. He's our creator He's our Savior. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for us so we know that He loves us. He's a God that can do anything beyond what we can ask or imagine. He's a God who's promised He will deliver us. We need to remember and meditate on these truths to get things in the right perspective. And then at the end, at the end of the day, we have to exercise faith and believe God's in control. He's sovereign. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's going on. It's always going to take faith. That's how God has designed our relationship with him. Faith. We have faith that he has a plan and a purpose that is good for what is going on. If we do those things we're going to be responding in the best possible way to whatever crises we face in life. And we're going to position ourselves in the best possible way for God to then answer our prayers and intervene and deliver us. In His timing, in His way, but He will. You know, Jesus... Jesus said he would be with us always, always. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. The Bible tells us he's up at the right hand of God right now, interceding for us, praying for us on our behalf. Hebrews calls him our sympathetic high priest. He understands what we're going through because he's been tempted and dealt with everything that we have. And so in the end of the day, we know we can go to Jesus and he's there for us. And we can trust him completely. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us to understand it. And specifically tonight, thank you, Lord Jesus, just for the promise of you being there for us and the fact that we can trust you completely. When we, when we face problems, whether they're huge and overwhelming or even the small ones, Lord, we don't have to be afraid, that we can just trust in you. And I pray that you would remind us of that, Lord, when we face these things and instead of panicking and trying to fix things on our own and freaking out, that we just remember first of all to turn to you, to lay it all before you, to remember who you are, to ask, humbly ask for your help and to believe that you'll hear our prayers and answer them. 
I pray for anybody here tonight, Lord, who's really going through one of those tough seasons or facing one of these huge crises, Lord. I just pray that you would give them your peace tonight as they hear this word. And for those of us who aren't facing a huge crisis, we know we will sometime. Help us to store these truths away in our hearts. We'll be ready for them. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, we look forward to when you come back for us. But until then, help us to to live our lives completely for you, for your glory, to lift up your name above all the other names so people will be drawn to you. And we just invite you to work in and through us, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we just thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.